Welcome back to Top 5 Scary. I'm your host, Kyle McWaters. Yeah, so I've just unlocked a new fear. Here's the top five terrifying human experiments that will haunt you. Number five, the monster study. Wow, right into it, huh? Great name for it and all. The monster study was a terrifying and triggering speech and stuttering experiment that took place in 1939. Performed on 22 orphans and conducted by Wendell Johnson, the professor of speech and pathology at the University of Iowa. Half of the people received positive speech therapy, praising the fluency of their speech. I just watched King's speech with Colin Firth, and let me tell you, yeah, it's uh, nothing like that, no. That had a happy ending with metaphors and lessons interwoven. This is just science being cruel. Because the other half, the negative speech therapy, which includes belittling the subjects for speech imperfections, yeah, just straight up of chirping at people, suffering a lifetime of obvious emotional stress already, and of course, retaining that stress and speech difficulty for the remainder of their life. It was dubbed the monster study as some of Johnson's peers were absolutely pissed and horrified that he would experiment on orphanage subjects at such a tender age in development to confirm his hypothesis. Yeah, sick stuff, dude, really? Basically, good reinforcement meant fast learning. You ever been yelled at by a parent while doing math? Yeah, it's horrible. On top of everything, the experiment was kept hidden for fear Johnson's reputation would be tarnished in the wake of human experiments conducted during the war. Uh, you think? The results were actually never published, and his thesis is the only official record of the details. Apparently, the university apologized in 2001, but the university assistant professor of speech pathology said the data collected from the experiment is unfortunately the largest collection of scientific information on stuttering that we have, and that Johnson's work was the first to discuss the importance of the thoughts and beliefs and feelings of the actual individual struggling. Number four, multiple births. The 1960s were a dark time for medicine. Clinical psychiatrist Peter Nobauer and a couple of professors at Yale University thought it'd be a good idea to persuade Louise Wise Services, an adoption agency, to send twins and triplets to completely different homes without telling the adoptive parents and they were adopting a child who was of uh, another sibling. And neither did the biological parents, of course. <laughs> Whoa, what? Yeah, that's not cool. I can see angry mama bears right now just clawing at the screen. Apparently, researchers sponsored by Children's Services secretly compared their research and progress in now what is called the infamous twins study. The research was never completed, but what was left behind was the unethical treatment and trauma of separating individuals at birth. That didn't end, apparently, in New York until the 1980s. In 1990, a decade after the confidential study, Nobauer and the Child Development Center of the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services arranged to actually house the locked records at Yale. University. The Jewish board set terms that gave the organization power to approve or deny any requests to access the records for the next 75 years. In 2018, apparently a couple thousand pages were released to the public, but of course, like all things intending to be silent, the pages were heavily redacted. Yeah, lots of sharpieing. Yo, this is absolutely terrifying, okay? Like, what did they find in that study? Also, so sad. There's been a couple documentaries now covering this study and focusing on the trauma it's caused to those who again begged to gain access to their own files. In 2011, apparently the Jewish board denied two separate twins the request to access their own sealed records. So what exactly happened that made these scientists so secretive of their work? Number three, Stanford Prison. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted in the summer of 1971. Pretty standard university experiment. A two-week simulation of a prison environment that examined the effects of situational variables on participants. Yeah, what could go wrong, right? Well, we just heard how when it comes to university studies, the law all of a sudden becomes this imaginary thing. Stanford University psychology professor Philip Zimbardo led this research study. Participants were recruited from the local ad and a local school newspaper engineered by the research team, offering only male participants 15 bucks per day for those to participate in a fun study looking at prison life. Ha <laughs> yeehaw. People were handpicked after psych assessments, then randomly assigned roles of either prisoner or guard. Like a giant game of cops and robbers, right? The guards were given uniforms and instructed to prevent prisoners from escaping. No rules. The experiment officially started when prisoners were booked by real Palo Alto police. And over the next five days, psychological abuse by the guards became more and more sadistic. 
The experiment was actually forced to end on the sixth day. Let's just say it got so violent, it's known as one of the most unethical psychological experiments in history. The harm and abuse inflicted on the participants prompted universities worldwide to improve their own ethics departments, and experiments were then severely reevaluated by the educational board before they began. This was an example of use of power, the barbarism of humans, the sick experimental boundaries those are risking to put others through for career breaking research. Scary stuff. Number two, Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were a series of 16 separate targeted murders committed over the span of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The culprits? You guessed it, William Burke and William Hare. These two were so rotten, they actually dug up and sold corpses to surgeons like Robert Knox for dissection. You see, Edinburgh was the leading city of anatomical study in the 1800s, and all that research demanded a ton of cadavers to experiment on. Due to the rapid shortage of cadavers to do research on, hence the time of medicine, grave digging became a huge issue. Scottish law required that all corpses used for medical research shall only come from deceased prisoners or sick houses. Okay, <laughs> and cue organized crime. This led body snatching to become a huge thing. I mean, easy and plentiful to make a quick buck, right? But to make sure graves were left untouched, mort safes and gates were put up in cemeteries to act as almost like bear traps on top of the graves. Of course, this is where our gentlemen come into this. The men, instead, decided to go on a rampage taking fresh and very alive victims' bodies right then and there. Yeah, gruesome stuff. Then they would take them on down to the medical center and payday. The police offered Hare immunity from prosecution if he knew anything. Basically, if you snitch, your name's clean. He fessed up the details immediately of the victims and confessed to all 16 deaths with his accomplice. Formal charges were made against Burke and he was hanged to death. His corpse was dissected and his skeleton displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2022, still remains. Okay, the last part's a little sadistic, no? Also very ironic. Number one, Jose Delgado. Rodriguez Delgado's research was cutting edge for his time. It was centered on the use of electrical signals to invoke responses in the brain. This is like way before Neuralink and scientists were trying to microchip us for like Interac and stuff. It was the early 40s, a dark time for medicine. Famed for his research on mind control through electrical stimulation of the brain. His earliest work was actually with cats, but of course, if you haven't guessed, he later experimented with monkeys and then eventually humans, specifically psychiatric patients. Delgado's work was centered around a certain invention he coined the stimosiever, a radio which joined the stimulator of brainwaves with a receiver. This allowed the subject of an experiment full freedom of movement while allowing the experimenter to control the experimentee. Very sci-fi for the time, you know? Basically the math behind putting a giant antenna in your head, but it's inside your head. The stimosiever was used to simulate emotions and control the person's behavior. Stimulation on different points in the amygdala in four patients produced a variety of effects including deep concentration, odd feelings, and colorful visions. Okay, no, not so bad so far. Delgado could not only elicit emotions, he could also elicit tons of movement. Yeah, we're talking weekend at Bernie's type movement, but subtle at first, like a limb or the clenching of a fist, then bigger limbs and more movement. Basically, this guy was driving you via your brain. Mad scientist or the pioneer of electric brain stimulation? Mm, maybe you can be both. Hey, thanks for watching Top 5 Scary. Hope we creeped you out. Stay spooky and we'll see you next time.